Hello listeners, welcome to another episode of Advocates the Podcast. Today, we'll speak to Professor Carlton Larson, scholar of American constitutional law and Anglo-American legal history, and one of the nation's leading authorities on the law of treason and exploring treason in a historical and modern context. Please enjoy the show. This episode, we have with us Professor Carlton Larson of UC Davis. Professor, good morning from us here in Kuala Lumpur, and welcome to Advocates the Podcast. Well, thank you. Very happy to be here. And you are a unique guest for us on this program because you're going to speak to us not about your just your journey as an advocate, and we will touch on that, but you're going to speak to us today about revolutionary lawyers, that is lawyers during the time of the revolution, as well as Lincoln, and you're going to speak to us about, uh, about treason as well. So can we kick off by asking you a little bit about yourself? Tell us where you're from and tell us what you do now. Okay, sure. I grew up in a small town in western North Dakota, which is sort of in the middle of the United States. North Dakota is right in the Great Plains, up next to the Canadian border. And then from there, I went to Harvard for college, where I studied American history. And then I did my law degree uh, at Yale. After that, I was a law clerk for a year to a federal appellate judge in Phoenix, Arizona. And then I spent three years I'm at the law firm of Covington and Burling in Washington, D.C., where I did commercial litigation and some white-collar criminal work. And then from Covington, I, I left to become a law professor, and so I started teaching at the UC Davis School of Law in 2004, and I teach courses in constitutional law and Anglo-American legal history. And tell us a little bit about your areas of research and scholarship at the moment. Yeah, so I've... I've tended to flit around and write about all kinds of things, but I'm probably most known as a person who writes about treason law. So I have two books about treason and some law review articles on the subject. I'm very interested in 18th century America and how lawyers functioned and worked during that period. And then, of course, all the things that one teaches as a constitutional law professor, you can get excited by various rabbit holes and start running down them <laughs> in various ways, too. So, yeah, which you can't do as a commercial lawyer, of course. Yeah. Yes, exactly. The great advantage of being a professor is the, the rabbit holes. You don't have to account for them on your timesheet every day. Tell us about your latest book. What's it called? So, the latest book is called On Treason A Citizen's Guide to the Law. And this was released in September of last year. And the book is written really as a, a layman's guide to the law of treason. There's been a lot of discussion in America over the last three, four years about treason and who is a traitor and who is not. And so I thought it'd be useful to provide a guide for people that would give them an understanding of what treason law is in a way that's you know, comprehensible for a person who's not trained in the law. But at the same time, I hope the book will be of interest to lawyers as well, because it's one of those areas of law that really nobody has a practice in treason law. It's just not an area that comes up a whole lot. Yeah. So let's sort of pivot to that and ask you, why treason and how did you get into studying that? Yeah, this was one of those things that was almost sort of pure serendipity. When I was in college, I was reading a biography of one of the lawyers we'll, we'll talk about later, James Wilson, and I read that he had represented persons who were accused of treason against the state of Pennsylvania during the revolution. I thought, well, this is really strange. Here's this guy who signed the Declaration of Independence. What's he doing representing these guys who sided with the British. And so I started learning more about Wilson, and I started learning a little bit more about treason during the revolution. And I just thought, this point, this is really fascinating. What happens when you have this sudden shift in loyalty, when was once your duty, which was being loyal to the king, now becomes a crime? And how does the law work that out? And so I ended up writing my senior thesis in college on this subject of, of treason in uh, the revolution in Pennsylvania. And then once I got into my academic job, I really had the time to really dig into it much more deeply. And so that was sort of the subject of my my first book, The Trials of Allegiance, Treason Juries, and the American Revolution. So could you give us a snapshot of how that law of treason kind of developed and that definition developed uh, during the revolution? Yeah. So initially, there's a lot of debate prior to independence as to whether resistance activity was treason or not. And so you had a lot of arguments about that with American leaders, including people like James Wilson, saying, no, it's not treason to resist what we think are unlawful British policy. Once the war breaks out, you're in this very awkward situation for about a year where the colonies claim to be formally allegiant to the king, but are nonetheless openly fighting the king. So that creates a lot of problems in terms of what you do with the people who are actually aiding the king. And so one of the motivations for the Declaration of Independence is 
actually allowing treason prosecutions. That once we were an independent nation, the people who aided Britain could be treated as traitors. And so then post-1776, you you actually have some trials, and, and those are very interesting. And then eventually we get a definition of treason written into our constitution. And tell us a little, so give us a couple of examples of those trials that occurred immediately after the declaration. Yeah, sure. The ones I looked at most closely were a series of trials in Philadelphia in 1778 and 1779, where about 23 people were tried for treason for aiding the British during the British occupation of Philadelphia. And what I found most interesting about those trials was essentially almost all of the people were acquitted. And in the few cases where there was a conviction, the jurors and the presiding judges all petitioned for clemency. And I was trying to sort of understand why this was. And one of the conclusions I came to was the sense that treason was just simply viewed as different from other crimes. That is, if you looked at the law books in Blackstone, they all say treason is the highest crime known to the law. But juries just simply didn't treat it that way. That is, I think they viewed it as a political crime, a political mistake, that this was something that, this, this was a civil war that basically ripped the country in half. And so you had people who were on the American side, people on the British side, but everybody knew someone on the other side. It was a, a brother or, a, or an uncle or a business associate or, or whatever. And so you didn't view them really as incorrigible criminals, as evil people, but as people who could be reformed. And so hanging them just didn't seemed like it made sense or wasn't appropriate to the crime. Michelle? But clearly some people felt very strongly about treason because James Wilson, he was attacked at his home, right, for representing people in treason trials. So clearly the public felt strongly. Yeah, so there was a heated popular rhetoric against the people who had aided the British. And as you note, uh, James Wilson, who was one of the attorneys in these cases, uh, he almost lost his life when an armed mob attacked his house. And one of the reasons they gave for that was that he had been a lawyer in these trials for the defendants. And so I think one of the things that shows is once you get into the courtroom and once you really get in front of a jury, a lot of those heated passions can go away. And that the legal process, I think, worked in many ways during the revolution, that whatever sort of nonsense and violence one saw outside the courtroom, that largely wasn't the case once these cases actually went to trial. So it seems to me that these trials had less to do with legal reasoning than sort of the realities on the ground, that the divisions that were there. That's how they were decided. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, very few of the cases raised, you know, sort of really novel legal issues. I mean, there's, there was one that was sort of interesting where a person fled from the American army to the British army, but he made a mistake and it was actually the American army he had fled to. And so the question was, well, he'd attempted to commit treason, but you hadn't actually done so. And so, so that, that was an interesting <laughs> case. But most of these, it was pretty clear cut where the person, right. in, uh, my mind seems they actually had done it. Yeah. And so the real issue really is what do we do? What is the proper punishment? Got it. Well, okay, thanks for that. That's a lovely snapshot. And I'd like now to turn to considering the larger topic we wanted to explore today, which was these individuals, these lawyers who played such a big role during the revolution immediately after. And of course, we end with Abraham Lincoln. So the lawyers during the revolution that we're going to be speaking about, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Wilson, uh, James Wilson, who you've mentioned, we're going to speak a little bit about John Quincy Adams as well. But can we start with the legal system in revolutionary America? Where did that come from? Where was it imported from? Sure. So the American colonies were all eventually became English colonies. There were a few that had started out as other colonies. New York, for example, started out as a Dutch colony. In the 17th century, many of the legal systems were really quite aberrant in the sense that there was often just sort of an entirely indigenous system of law. So in the New England colonies, you had what amounted to theocracies, where the law was really the law of the Old Testament, applied by magistrates and had seemingly very little connection to do with English law. By the time of the American Revolution, you had essentially had a a thorough Anglicization of all of these colonies' legal systems. And so it was really possible for lawyers in any colony to speak coherently with lawyers in other colonies, that they'd be operating within a common legal framework and it'd become much closer to the law um, that you would have seen in England in Westminster Hall. It was no longer sort of this provincial aberrant law. And so you had a number of lawyers who were prominent. You had some who had trained in England. Uh, as as barristers, particularly in colonies like Pennsylvania or South Carolina. And then you also had the run of most lawyers, which were simply people who trained as apprentices under other lawyers and came to the bar that way. 
And to, speaking of training of lawyers uh, during the revolutionary period, how did one become a, an advocate? Yeah, so there were no law schools at the time. And my students are often surprised with this because they're so used to this sort of three-year American postgraduate model of legal education. They th- assume that's the norm. And when I tell them, not only was it not the norm for most of American history, it's not the norm at hardly anywhere else in the world either. They're all very surprised. So no one in this period is going to a law school. You know, as I noted, if a few people could, who had the money and the resources did go to England and trained in the Inns of Court. But for the most part, what you did was you went to college. You didn't have to go to college, but a lot of them did. And then afterwards, you would train for a year or two as an apprentice to another lawyer. You would then get admitted to a bar. You would take some type of oral examination before a judge. And that would be your process to becoming a lawyer. Curious question, I'm sorry, but did you have to pay for your apprenticeship? Yes, you did. Yeah, so it's very much like the UK in that same sort of period that you paid people to learn learn from them, right? Okay, there was no sort of formal training. One would presume that how you developed as a lawyer depended clearly upon your own industry and your own talent, but largely upon who your master was. Yes, and the problem with this system was that the, the quality of the lawyers who were taking people in really varied quite widely. There were some who did a great job and others who were largely indifferent. We'll get to John Adams, but he learned after his apprenticeship, he still had absolutely no idea how to file any papers in court. And he actually botched his first case because he didn't file the papers correctly. James Wilson, for all his other qualities, was apparently pretty bad as someone to be an apprentice to because he was sort of aloof and distant and so busy with his work that he didn't spend a lot of time training People, they, so a lot of the men just sit in the law office reading books on their own and trying to figure out what they can. And if they were lucky, they got a lot of hands-on training and attention. But it was not, I think, you know, a particularly good system, reliably producing well-trained lawyers. Yeah. Michelle? Right. What did judges, you said they were admitted to bar after an oral examination before the judges. Would that act as a filter? For the quality of advocate? Yeah, that was the idea, was that it would. But that would also depend on just how good the or examination was. Because there were judges who took that very seriously, and there were judges who didn't. And certainly by the 19th century, sometimes the oral exam would be like, tell us your name and are you a good person? And you would answer yes, and that would be the extent of it. Or maybe, you know, read, a, read from page 36 of this book to show that you're literate. That was very common in many places, you know, particularly in, in frontier areas of America. So it wasn't anything as rigorous as the bar exams that we now have. But I must admit, I can see one parallel from that system to now in the Commonwealth, at least, that, that young lawyers learn generally at the expense of their clients. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> That's, I think, a constant over the centuries. Let's now turn to John Adams, the first of these characters that we want to speak about. Tell us a little bit about his background. Yeah. So John Adams came from a what was a relatively provincial background in Massachusetts. He, he grew up in the area of then part of Braintree, I think now it's part of Quincy, Massachusetts. So this is an area south of Boston, and he was not part of the sort of the wealthy elite of the colony. When he went off to Harvard College, he was the first in his family to do so, and they ranked students by social rank, and John Adams ranked 15th out of 25 in his class, so in the bottom half in terms of social rank. And I think that was always something that it hung over him for the rest of his life, in the sense that he always really felt the need to prove himself and to work very, very hard and to demonstrate that he's not just a provincial lawyer, but somebody who can really operate at a very high level. And when he came into practice and his apprenticeship, tell us a little bit about his journey there. So he was an apprentice for a couple of years. Yeah, his first case, as I mentioned, was, was a botch because he didn't do the Um, the paperwork correctly, and he practiced in Braintree for a while. But he eventually moved to Boston and began practicing there and developed a reputation as a very solid lawyer. Solid in the sense of not exceptional, just sort of got the job done? Yeah, I mean, I think he was, Adams was a very bookish man. And so if you look through some of his cases, he did the homework. I mean, he was a guy, this was, in one of the examples, this was one of his admiralty cases where they're relying on civil law. And so he just used the institutes, Justinian, but he's using the digest as well to check various points with respect to the admiralty case. And there were very few American lawyers who would have had that kind of command of Roman law at the time. But it was not, was he was not, and really none of these lawyers that we'll be talking about were flashy in the sense of people who could go into a courtroom and deliver a sort of stem-winding oration and have a jury just hanging from their fingers. There were lawyers like that. I mean, James Otis in Massachusetts was somebody that Adams looked up to and wanted to be like Otis. But he knew he just, that just wasn't him. 
that he could never really be that kind of lawyer. But what he could be was very well prepared and effective, even if he's not sort of, uh, you know, throwing stardust all over the place. Right. And how was practice organized then in terms of advocates? Were they members of chambers? Well, what office, did they congregate together Is in a particular area in town or was it disparate? It was very fragmented. So Adams was uh, you know, a solo practitioner for his entire career. And that was true for most of the lawyers in 18th century America. There may have been a very few where there were partnerships where two lawyers worked together. But for the most part, these were individuals. And part of that, it was just such a small profession. And there really weren't that many lawyers. In Boston at the time, you're maybe talking 20 people total who would have been members of the bar. And so they really didn't have the ability to specialize in a way that you might think of in terms of forming a form, a firm or, or forming a, a chambers. Did they do fused work? They did the work of solicitors and advocates as well? Or did they kind of, did the advocates gravitate to just doing the advocacy and the solicitors gra- gravitate to doing the paperwork? So there were some f- brief attempts to try to make that happen, none of which were successful. Right. And again, part of the problem is you just didn't have the people. You didn't have an institution like the Inns of Court that could serve as the sort of the credentialing function for you know who would be a barrister, who would be a solicitor. And so you didn't have the population or in some ways even the wealthy clients that could support that level of specialization. So essentially, an 18th century American lawyer had to do more or less all the business that came in. And some would be known more for commercial disputes or for other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But I suspect almost every lawyer at some point probably had drafted a will or had done a land transaction or had reviewed a a shipping contract, something like that. When when we're on Johnson and on how he was like as a lawyer, I find it very interesting that you say he was a solid one. How do you know? Because normally solid or decent, but not outstanding lawyers are not really recorded or spoken of. How did you manage to form that view? Well, I don't mean solid in any way of a negative sense. I mean, I do think he was an excellent lawyer. It's just that his skills were not necessarily of the oratorical kind, you know, and I think for most lawyers, that's tends to be true, that, you know, you would much prefer the thorough researcher to the really glib phrase maker mm. in terms of ultimately winning cases. So even if one is not necessarily thrilling everybody in the audience, you may still be winning your cases. And at the end of the day, that's what your clients are going to care about. Yep, I completely agree. Professor, but I was wondering, how did they keep records then? Did the court have transcripts? Did they document the cases? How did that happen? There's, it's a mix of things that survived. We have the court, they, they kept basic dockets, so we're usually able to look at those. There are sometimes uh, transcripts that were kept in shorthand. Sometimes there's notes. One of our best sources usually is notes taken during a trial, either by the judges or by the advocates. I don't believe that the standard courtroom shorthand had been invented yet in that period. And so You didn't have an occupation of a court reporter where you could expect that there would be a a word-for-word transcript of what occurred, and you couldn't really generate, again, a word-for-word record that you could use on appeal. And then partly just, you know, appeals weren't really a part of much 18th century practice uh, anyway. So what we know tends to come from either the notes kept by participants or often sometimes, you know, letters or descriptions by people who were present uh, in the courtroom. Before we we move on to the next area, something you said earlier about John Adams at college really caught my attention. You said they were ranked by social sort of order in class. Can you tell us more about that? Because it's the first I've heard of this. um, Yeah, and it was basically, you know, the social rank of your parents and so sort of where you stood in the colony. And, And, you know, this is very hard for us to imagine now that that was something that was done. But I mean, the 18th century was very much a world where social rank mattered deeply. And it mattered less in North America than it did in England. But if you think about England, it's this incredibly class-bound society where everybody knew exactly where they stood on the pecking order and who was their superior and who was their inferior. And that extended into America as well. And one of the things that the revolution did was it actually took away a lot of that and where everybody or at least every white man was now a gentleman whereas previously that would have been a term reserved only for people of a certain social class or social standing but in this pre-revolutionary world that type of attention to hereditary social rank was seen as just 
the way things were. Yeah, it's, that's interesting. But I, I guess it's still reflected in some ways. I mean, one looks at fraternities in Harvard, for example. One could possibly argue that those social grades still exist in, in some form. Let me now ask you about uh, Adams and the famous trial that he acted in, which was the uh, the Boston Massacre. Of course, he became one of the founding fathers and one of the leading advocates for independence. Tell us how he became involved in this case, acting for British soldiers accused of uh, a massacre in Boston. Yeah, so this was, is one of those instances where you know Adams really made a name for himself. He took on an exceptionally unpopular case. And this was the incident was known as the Boston Massacre. It was where people had been taunting British troops. They'd been throwing sticks and snowballs at them, and they ended up returning, opening fire, uh, with the result that approximately six people were killed. And then it was memorialized as the Boston Massacre, and a famous lithograph by Paul Revere uh, you know, basically just shows the you know, British troops sort of wantonly firing into a crowd of, of peaceful Americans. And so the soldiers were tried for murder. And Adams was their uh, defense counsel, and he agreed to do this, partly out of the view that, you know, everybody is entitled to a defense. And he was willing to do that, even at the risk of some unpopularity. But I, I think it ultimately helped him as a lawyer. It brought, it gave him a lot of attention, and it suggested that he was a person who was fairly uncorrupt in the sense that he would do what he thought was right, kind of regardless of how people might do it. And so ultimately, it ended up being one of those defining moments in his career. And if I'm not mistaken, he managed to secure an acquittal for them, did he not? Yes. Yes, he did. Yeah, which I suppose says something as well. I mean, I'm interested. It says something about the juries that must have sat in Boston at the time. Yeah, and I think it does say something about, again, his skill as an advocate. I mean, presumably, it was, you know, he would have used his peremptory strikes, for example, shrewdly, probably to help select the jury in the way that he wanted. And then he had a sense of how to pitch his, his client's story to that jury. Okay, so moving now to up the social ladder to Thomas Jefferson for, of Virginia. I assume he would have been rated fairly high up on the social scale. Tell us a little bit about his background. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. I mean, Thomas Jefferson, one of the most you know, wealthy people in colonial America, the, you know, owned several hundred slaves, lived on his mansion on, on, on a mountaintop in Virginia. So he attended college at uh, William and Mary and then spent several years studying as, as an apprentice with George Wythe. And George Wythe was probably the leading legal mind um, at the time Jefferson was studying. He later became a law professor at William and Mary, really the first law professor in the United States. And so Jefferson learned a lot from uh, Wythe, and that certainly uh, was an asset to him. Jefferson later appointed Wythe to that position as a law professor when Jefferson was governor of Virginia. And did he practice law at all? Yeah. So Jefferson was a practitioner from 1767 to 1774, and he practiced in the general court in Williamsburg, Virginia, which was the capital of Virginia. And there was a sort of separation of the bar at that time between lawyers who practiced in the county courts and lawyers who practiced in the general court. And that's where, where Jefferson practiced. He specialized in land cases, um, drafted a lot of wills. And so it, he wasn't there all the time. He was in, at his estate, Monticello, much of the time. But when the court was in session, he would be there in Williamsburg. And from what I've read of him, about him, he seemed to be a sort of fairly um, quiet man. And so what was he like as an advocate? Do we know what he was like as an, as an advocate? Yeah, we don't have a whole lot of great evidence about his appearances in court. But we do know from later years, absolutely, as you noted, he was a quiet man. He was a shy person. He did not think of himself as a good public speaker. And I think that's probably right. I and mean, he, the State of the Union address, he started delivering it in writing instead of doing it orally because he thought he could communicate better in writing than he did public. And so part of it, I think, was a certain shyness. And he was also growing up in the legal culture where they had you know, some truly spectacular orators, people like Patrick Henry, who were really well known as people with a phenomenal oratorical skill. And compared to them, Jefferson you know, knew he, he could never again, you know, kind of like Adams, never measure up to people like that. So he was, I think, in, like Adams in the sense of, of a careful lawyer, but not a, a courtroom showboat. That's really interesting. I mean, these are the two giants of the revolution, yeah. and yet both of them have that sort of same demeanor in, in court. That's remarkable. Very interesting indeed. And do we know whether he was a successful advocate at the bar? It, it appears so. You know, he had a lot of clients. He had hundreds of 
cases. And so it seemed that he was doing a good business. Obviously, uh, Jefferson, uh, well known for the, firstly, the elegance of his pen, and then obviously you know, one of the leading intellectuals of the, of the revolution. How much did, he, did him being a lawyer inform his approach to the Declaration of Independence, which he drafted? Yeah, it's a hard question. You know, sometimes people have said, well, the Declaration of Independence reads like an indictment in the way that, you know, it specifies sort of the basic legal framework, and then it gives you all of these counts, all of these charges against the king and all of the ways in which that the king has failed. And I think there's something to that. On the other hand, 18th century indictments tended to be very boilerplate and didn't you know, specify charge by charge by charge. So it's not clear he was necessarily thinking of, of criminal indictments, but he was at least marshalling the facts, I think, you know, in a way that a lawyer does in terms of building uh, their case. And I think another way that his legal perspective shaped this was the declaration is absolutely scorching indictment of the King of Great Britain. And much of the objections that the colonists had were to Parliament. And it's really only once the war gets going that the King becomes really implicated and that people realize that the King is in on this as well. But Jefferson writes was a fairly, fairly fiercely anti-monarchical draft. And I think part of this is Jefferson revered Lord Cook. That is that he viewed Cook as one of the, you know, sort of the greatest Whigs that had ever lived. And Cook, of course, well known for his battles against the king and for asserting parliamentary supremacy against James I and later Charles I and for arguing against various kinds of, of royal prerogative. And so Jefferson had this very much this anti-monarchical strand, and much more so than, than John Adams did, uh, for example. Adams, I don't think, shared that much at all. And Jefferson also had the very peculiar sort of anti-English sense of the law. As much as he revered Cook, uh, he hated the Normans, and he was convinced that English law had gone wrong in 1066, and that the true English law was the Anglo-Saxon law. So he said the 8th century Anglo-Saxon laws were the wisest laws that have ever been created. Now, I don't know anybody else who's ever looked at those Anglo-Saxon laws and thought this was the, you know, the greatest monument to uh, human intellect that's out there. But Jefferson thought that, and he actually wanted the seal of the United States to be Hanga and Horsa, who were the original legendary Anglo-Saxon invaders hmm. of England. And so he wanted that you know, tied directly to the founding of the United States. And indeed, when he revised the Virginia Criminal Code in 1778, his citations were to Anglo-Saxon law you know, not to later English law. So he had this sense of really, let's go all the way back to the pre-Norman conquest as a way of reinvigorating American law. And so you might think of the Declaration of Independence in some ways, we're, we're not just getting rid of English kings, we're getting rid of everything <laughs> since the Norman conquest. Now, most of the other lawyers didn't share that view, but Jefferson was, was peculiar in a lot of ways. That's really interesting. Can I ask, because I mean, you, you speak of this background of him, in 1776, when he's sitting there drafting, where does he get the research from? Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's still remains, there's very few sources. There's, it's, it would have been looking at, I think, Ethelbert's laws and then most likely Alfred's laws, which had probably been published at some point, and he would have had access to those. And if you look through those laws, they're basically things like, you know, if you cut off somebody's toe, you pay this much. If it's a little toe, you pay this much. If it's a, you know, a finger, you pay this much. And so again, it's, it's hard for me to see what, you know, a trained lawyer found particularly thrilling about those laws. Let's turn now to, to James Wilson, who I think sparked your interest in, in the area of, of treason and sort of slightly less a well-known a revolutionary uh, figure than the first two. But give us a, a few headlines about, about him. Yeah, so he's, I think, really the most forgotten member of the founding generation, which is really surprising because when you look at his resume, it is really quite extraordinary. He was one of the leading theorists of the resistance movement with a famous 1774 pamphlet on the scope of parliamentary authority over the British colonies. He's one of six men who signed both the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. He was probably second only to James Madison in terms of influence at the Constitutional Convention. And then he was one of the first justices of the United States Supreme Court. And he delivered the first really significant series of public law lectures in the United States, which were modeled after the lectures of Blackstone at Oxford. So he's enormously important, but one that probably fewer than one in a thousand Americans has, has ever heard of. And tell us about his, uh, he was from Pennsylvania, correct? Yeah, so he actually was, was an immigrant from Scotland. He grew up on a farm in Scotland, went to St. Andrews, and then immigrated to the United States in his 20s. 
apprenticed with John Dickinson, who was a very prominent Pennsylvania lawyer and also a leader of the resistance movement. He then practiced law in Reading and in Carlisle, and then eventually practiced in Philadelphia, where he really made a, a name for himself. And what do we know about his advocacy and his approach to being a lawyer? Well, I'm afraid I'm starting to sound like a broken record here, but he actually was very similar to Adams and Jefferson in the sense of being, I suppose the word, he's, he's kind of a nerd. I mean, this was a guy who <laughs> really kind of dug into the books. His personality was viewed by most people as fairly cold and distant. Maybe some of that was people not quite following his goddess accent. I'm not sure. But he wasn't, you know, the sort of the backslapper politician type who sort of instantly becomes friends with everybody in the room. He too was a fairly reserved, fairly quiet person who really sort of, you know, saw his best advocacy coming through writing rather than through public speaking. Yes, it does seem to me that Johnny Cochran and, and Shapiro might not have found a place at the uh, at the convention <laughs> in 1776. No, and, and, uh, there seems to be a trend there, yeah. Yes, and it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. This episode of Advocates, the podcast, is supported by Taylor's Law School, where you get to learn about law and justice. Explore how these top advocates battle injustice as they tell us their stories. Right. Professor, how, how do you reconcile their personalities? I mean, Adams and Jefferson and you say Wilson as well. Their personalities as advocates, but um, their public life, they were politicians. That usually means, you know, in the, in the usual sense, they would be outspoken, they would be fighting for the cause. How, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the interesting things you know, is how many lawyers sort of came to the fore during the revolution. And I think part of that was that you know, so many of the arguments that were being made were ultimately legalistic arguments about the scope of British authority. And so lawyers were peculiarly well positioned to make those arguments and to provide sort of the intellectual framework for why resistance was appropriate. And so that probably brought them a prominence they might not otherwise have had. I mean, certainly temperamentally, they were probably very different than the people who really flourish, say, as generals in the Continental Army. I mean, that's just a different type of person. And so that was part of it. I think also part of it is it's just a different era, right, where nobody cares what you sound like on the radio. Nobody cares what you look like on TV. So many of the interactions are person to person, you know, small group discussions or even just, you know, debating in a in a room with 30 other people where there's no TV cameras or anything like that, even the sort of quiet, introverted person can do very well in that setting because they can stand up and make their speech and people listen to them. And it's not, you know, a, you know say a cable TV shouting match. And so that type of environment, you know, just works better you know, for that type of person in a way that it doesn't so much anymore. I mean, that's just really sort of logical analysis, isn't it? Just before we finish with James Wilson, I'm interested to know about those cases you spoke of when we when we started, where he acted for these in, in the treason cases in Pennsylvania. And then I think he also acted in the, in the Fort Wilson riots as well. Could you tell us a little bit about his, his role in, in that case? Yeah. So in these cases, and he appeared in a number of them, it's not clear exactly how many he appeared in, but he is arguing for the people who are going accused of undermining the American Revolution. You know, and if the American Revolution failed, right, the people who signed the Declaration of Independence were going to be in a world of hurt. Maybe it wouldn't have all been hanged, but there's a decent chance some of them would have. And Wilson probably would have been one of the, the top people singled out for some type of punishment. So he has absolutely everything to lose if the revolution fails. And yet he appears in court to defend people who are accused of aiding the British. And in some ways, I think you know this is even more impressive than what John Adams did with, with the, the Boston Massacre, even though the Adams and the Boston Massacre is well known and nobody knows the story of James Wilson. But doing this in the midst of the war, and the war doesn't end for another three years, and it easily could have gone the other way. This was an incredible act of bravery and just being, again, committed to the idea of every person entitled to a defense. And his life was at risk. And he, again, he almost died at the hands of an armed mob that was incensed at what he had done. And these trials, by the way, they took place in Independence Hall, across the hall from the room where the Declaration of Independence was signed. There's a big passageway there. And then the other side is the courtroom. And so October 2nd, 
1779, Wilson is defending a painter named William Wart, and he wins an acquittal. And two days later, the mob is at his house. You know, so that Pennsylvania State House, that meant a lot to him. That was where he signed the Declaration of Independence, where he signed the Constitution. But it's also where he conducted these uh, very important criminal trials. Can I ask this something that you, sorry, Michelle, come to you in just a second, that a common theme with John Adams and Wilson, this sense that everyone was entitled to a defense. Where did that come from? So that's, that's actually an issue I, I'm researching at the moment. Certainly in treason cases, it comes from the Treason Trials Act of 1696, which granted a defense counsel to persons accused of treason. So that had been part of English law for nearly 100 years. English courts start permitting defense counsel in felony cases in the 1730s. It had been allowed in misdemeanor cases well before that. But American jurisdictions seem to have allowed criminal defense counsel in felony cases earlier than in England. So Pennsylvania, for example, recognizes in 1701. So by the time of the revolution, you have far more examples of lawyers representing criminal defendants than you did in England at the same time. And it's ultimately a right to counsel is written into the U.S. Constitution and into many of the state constitutions that were adopted at the time of the revolution. So this seems to be an area where America was in many ways in advance of England. Okay, that's interesting. Michelle, yeah. Yes, Professor, did the cap rank rule exist at that time? Certainly, it wouldn't have been the case for civil cases. You, you could choose to represent someone or not in civil cases. There were instances where courts in cases of indigent criminal defendants would sometimes appoint an attorney to represent that person. And the general expectation was that you were supposed to take that and, and represent the client. But I suspect that if there were serious irreconcilable sort of conflict or problem, and there were other lawyers who were willing to take it, a court would probably allow you to step aside and put another lawyer in your place. Professor, just another one before we finish with James Wilson. He, as you said, he was so brave in his decision to act for these people in the treason trial, and he was so such a key person in the drafting. What caused him to fall out of public recognition? Why is he less well-known? Yeah, it's, it's really, in many ways, a very sad story. He had become deeply involved in land speculation. He really wanted to become a very wealthy person. He was certainly rich, but he wasn't super wealthy compared to some of his neighbors. And a lot of that speculation went wrong. And so Wilson ended up deeply in debt. And so while he was a justice of the United States Supreme Court, he was briefly imprisoned twice in debtor's prison, because at this point you could be you go to jail for failure to pay debts. And so this was really quite embarrassing to have a justice of the Supreme Court in that circumstance. Then he ended up dying in North Carolina. In some ways, you can really say almost on the run from his creditors. He ended up being buried in North Carolina. He wasn't brought back to Philadelphia for burial until the early 1900s. And so I think that sort of embarrassing way his life ended kind of cast a a shadow over much of what he had accomplished. There was the problem, most of his papers became because of the disarray of his later years, most of his papers were lost. So we don't have you know, the extensive set of letters that we have for people like Adams and Jefferson. And there may even just be the issue of the name. James Wilson is such a common name that it's easy to get confused with all kinds of other people who might have that same name. Can I quickly turn and just we need to just, I just want to deal with this very, very quickly, only because he was a boy during the, the revolution, John Quincy Adams, but was also a lawyer by training. Was he a successful advocate? So, yes, he was. I mean, he wasn't initially an advocate for very long. He was a lawyer for four years, 1790 to 1794. And he started out very slow. But by the time he was, you know, in his third or fourth year of practice, he was bringing in a lot of clients. He was making a reasonably decent income. But I think his problem was that he just found the law kind of boring. I mean, this was mm-hmm. a guy who had you know, lived under his father's wing as a child, including spending all kinds of places going to Europe and in the diplomatic courts and doing all these really amazing things as a boy. And then to come back and to do just kind of run-of-the-mill legal work it just didn't excite him all that much. So when he got a chance to be minister to the Netherlands in 1794, he took it. Mm-hmm. And then he practiced a little bit here and there afterwards, but most of his life was then later spent in public service as a diplomat or as a member of Congress and, and as president. But can I just ask you whether he was also a very low-key advocate? I think so. I mean, his own self-description of one of his arguments was that it was... Uh, tedious and boring. 
Although that said, when he did have sort of the most famous case of his career, the Amistad case, yeah. where a member of Congress, he argued that the case of, of uh, slaves who had overthrown a ship and sought their freedom, he basically gave what amounted to flights of oratory rooted more, mostly in probably you know, natural law and all kinds of other things, and didn't really get into the actual legal arguments, which had been more properly presented in some of the papers presented by other lawyers in the case. But that was, you know, Adams in his 70s, and so it probably is not necessarily a, a fair reflection of what he was like as a young lawyer. Amistad case, obviously hugely famous and well-known. I wanted to just ask about the advocates at this time. And of course, the oral argument was important, oral argument to juries and oral argument to the Supreme Court. Do we know how they prepared these arguments? Did they sit there and painstakingly write them down before they delivered them? I think some of them did. And you know, now in our modern U.S. Supreme Court, essentially the briefs are 98% of the game. The oral argument is you know, half an hour for each side. It's very, very brief. In some of these cases that Adams argued in the early 1800s, you had no written briefs, or if they were, they were very, very short, maybe seven pages, eight pages. And oral argument could sometimes go on for three or four days. And so lawyers would present these extensive oral arguments, often in, uninterrupted by the judges. And so you have to believe that the lawyers spent a fair amount of time preparing those arguments when they had so much time where they had to talk. I suppose for the half an hour to get today. Let's jump across to the 19th century now and Abraham Lincoln, the last of the lawyers we're going to speak about today. Was his training any different from the training that the, the guys before the, or during the revolution had? Yeah, in the sense that he essentially had no training at all. Oh, okay. You know, Abraham, <laughs> I mean, Abraham Lincoln was you know, born essentially in, in poverty in Kentucky. He lived in Indiana, eventually lived in Illinois at a point when it was very much the, the frontier. And he was pretty much entirely self-taught. He got a copy of the four volumes of Blackstone in, in, when he was a young man, and he basically sat out on a hill reading them. And he said, you know, nothing had ever absorbed me in my entire life as much as reading these books. And so he eventually read enough and learned enough that he was able to get himself admitted to the bar without doing any formal training. He had very little schooling, and he didn't do an apprenticeship in the way that all of these other lawyers had done. So his career was in some ways typical of many of these lawyers in this period because admissions to the bar had gotten even more relaxed. You didn't have to do some of this hoop jumping that earlier generations of lawyers had to do, particularly in places like rural Illinois. And what about sort of, I mean, he didn't have that training. How did he become an advocate? How did he become a lawyer? Read Plaxton's and then from there, how do you have the job to become a lawyer? Yeah, so, yeah. And then he essentially went to the court and, and, you know, they did their oral exam and he passed and, and that was that. And then, you know, from that point on, he was essentially, you know, his skills and his talent, you know, then carried his profession forward. And now, unlike the other gentlemen we spoke about, who had fairly short careers at the bar before they became politicians, Lincoln practiced for 20 years. Do we know more about his life as an advocate and the cases that he did? Yeah. So, I mean, Lincoln really is, I think, more than any of these other folks, really a lawyer, right? I mean, he's a practicing lawyer the day he gets uh, becomes elected president of the United States. And he had practiced with a, really a whole range of things. I mean, he ranging from representing railroad corporations, which are probably you know, the wealthiest clients of the era, down to murder cases, almost you know anything that might come through the door. And a big part of what he did was traveling the circuit. So he was part of the, was the East Judicial Circuit in Illinois. And that meant you, know, you traveled from town to town to town with the lawyers and the judges hearing cases. And it was that same tiny band of people who would be there. And they would the, so the lawyers and judges would share not only, you know, they'd be they'd dining together every night, they would be sharing hotel rooms. Sometimes they'd even be sharing a bed. I mean, Lincoln would be lying in bed with the judge because that's what you did. Uh, you know, like, not figuratively, yeah. literally in bed, right, with, with the judge. And one of the things that that does, right, was it, it creates a culture, right, which I think in some ways was you know, the model for the ends of court where you treat each other well, right? Because you know you're going to see this person the next day and the next day after that and the next day after that. And so you do not act like a giant jerk when it comes to, you know, various arguments and, and moves you could make in court. And so it creates a very sort of, you know, strong sense of collegiality among these lawyers and judges as they're moving through the country, bringing justice to many of these small towns. That's really interesting. And what sort of cases did he take? So lots of them. There was a, a famous murder case where the plaintiff's witness had said that 
you know, he saw the person, uh, the defendant murder this person. And then Lincoln very famously pulled out an almanac and proved that there was a new moon that night. And so there was no way that the uh, plaintiff or the witness could have actually seen what had happened. He had you know, ship collision cases. He had patent cases. He argued one case before the U.S. Supreme Court, a statute of limitations case that he lost. But it really was a extraordinary wide range of things. And I think these these really exposed Lincoln to people at a very deep level, as witnesses, as jurors, as people in, in small towns. And so he had this real ability to communicate. And that's what he was really known for. He was not, in some sense, the bookish lawyer that an Adams or a Wilson was. I mean, he would he would do the research you could, but you, get, you carried basically eight books with yeah. you. That's what you had, your four volumes of Blackstone and Chitty and a few other things. But that was what you had. You know, it wasn't much. So he's not spending all his time just in a law library. What he's doing is distilling the issues down in a very clear way and making them accessible and presenting them to a jury that was really just kind of widely regarded as exemplary. So that's what I think what he was known for as a lawyer. So that's interesting. So his focus is more on the sort of forensic side of practice and the presentation yeah. and the human side of practice, I guess. Yeah. And if you think about you know, the other forensic abilities, if you look at Lincoln's writings in, in terms of just their sheer eloquence, I mean, they are worlds above anything written by any of the Adamses or mm. by Jefferson or by James Coles. I mean, he really is one of the most gifted rhetoricians who has ever lived, you know, perhaps anywhere in the world. How much of that do you think was informed by his being a lawyer? I think it gave him the practice, right? I mean, it just gave him all of these opportunities where he was constantly speaking, where this was very much an, an oral culture. And so it gave him the ability to do this, to write well and to write well quickly and to write well quickly under time pressure. And that's that's a hard thing to do. Sorry, Michelle. Professor, do we know anything about his cross-examination technique or skills? It was very good. I mean, there's there there actually a fairly extensive trial record survives of his last case before he became president, which was a murder trial. Yeah. And he was a very good cross-examiner. And I think he was someone who he could deliberately, you know, in, in a way, you know, he would, he would I, don't know if, I don't know if the correct phrase is underplay his intelligence, but he could he could appear in a very folksy manner to the jury and they would just casually ask certain questions to the witness. Well, can you just explain a little bit more of this or that? But he knows exactly where he's going and he's going to trap that witness up and do. And so he, so he was very, very skilled. Um, so you describe as him as a Columbo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> interesting. Okay. Brilliant. I think that's just, that, that's been really interesting to get an idea of these massive characters. Let's turn now to your special area just to close up our session, uh, which is, treason and about treason in the world today. And I think Razlan, uh, if I can just bring you in here on this, I think you you had some interesting thought on this. And I think the first thing that Razlan and I spoke about was how this concept of treason has changed over the years. And I think particularly Razlan, you had this issue about if you have two passports. Do you want to explore that with the, with the professor? Yes. Hi, Prof. My question is this. As I suppose internationalism has, has developed, there are now people with having two or three passports or two or three nationalities and having allegiances to various countries. We have now supranational organizations that transcend basically borders. How does treason now apply in, in these cases? If you are, say, a scientist working for a multinational corporation whilst also being a citizen of th three countries, where, for instance, how do you measure then your loyalty to your organization, to the, your employers, and also then to the countries that you belong to? It's really difficult. Yeah, that's a, that's a very hard question. And I think the answer you know, varies in terms of each country is going to have its own answer to that question. My sense is that every country will hold its citizens to a duty of loyalty to it. And I can tell you when that issue arose in the United States, uh, how our U.S. Supreme Court dealt with it. And that was, there was a case from World War II where a person had dual citizenship of the United States and Japan. And he ended up in Japan during World War II and then was accused of treason against the United States for what he did in Japan. And he argued, well, I was a citizen of Japan as well. And while I was in Japan, I was simply being loyal to Japan. And the U.S. Supreme Court rejected that and said, you don't get to play the fair weather citizen. If you are a citizen of the United States, you have an obligation of loyalty to us wherever you go in the world, regardless of whatever other dual citizenship you might have. 
And so you could be prosecuted for treason for what you did in Japan. Now, I don't know how other countries have dealt with it, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was the approach that other countries took, because it would be very strange, I think, to say that certain citizens get a pass when it comes to treason law just because they happen to be also citizens of a, another country. And they did recognize, the court did, that this puts people, in some cases, in a very hard position where they really are torn between loyalty to countries. But the court's response was, well, however you balance that, it can't be at the expense of the United States. And with regards to corporations, say Google, for instance, famously, I mean, it's not really a treason matter, but, you know, taxes, stuff like that. Where does loyalty, particularly for corporations who are treated as legal persons, supposed to lay in, you know, if you have issues of, I suppose, national security, etc., etc. My question is, what would you think the courts would do when faced with issues for non-human actors acting I suppose, treasonously. Yeah, that's a very hard question. And I actually have to thank Donald Trump for uh, making me think about this. Because while I was writing on treason, he tweeted something about, and I believe it was Google, that he thought Google should be tried for treason. And so that raised this issue of, well, could a corporation be subject to treason law, which is an issue I honestly had never thought of before. All the cases I had seen, of course, are all natural persons. They're not corporations. But I looked into it, and there's at least you know some conflicting law in the United States on when a corporation can be subject to crimes. Generally, it's, you know, in the case as well, there's certain things you clearly can't be, like bigamy, for example, or right? like it has to be a natural person. But for other stuff, I mean, we do hold corporations accountable for a variety of crimes. Our current statute is written, I think, I think is limited to natural persons. And so the interesting question would be, could we change that statute and subject uh, corporations to our treason laws? And then to what extent would the corporation be said to owe a duty of allegiance to the United States, particularly if it is one of these big, sprawling, multinational corporations? I mean, I do think the easy cases are any corporation incorporated in the United States could easily be said to owe a duty of allegiance to the United States. If you're doing business in the United States, I think at minimum we could say that one of the benefits of doing business here is that you don't engage in treason against us while you're here, so that we could at least expect that. But uh, for some of these other things, I think it would be quite difficult. And so my guess is if you did see in sort of you know real disloyalty coming through big multinational corporations, you might not use the law of treason to get at it. You might use a whole variety of other statutes that you can use to restrict the corporate behavior. And just to close up an area, again, I'm going to turn over to Razlan because this is um, his little <laughs> subject. Your, little, your niche, <laughs> Professor, on celebrities and naming their children. Razlan. Yes, I'd like to know. Well, all right. I, I could understand you being interested in treason as a result of the the really extremely brave example of shown by James Wilson and the great principle he showed there. But naming of celebrities and children, uh, Professor, could you just explain the motivation there? <laughs> and if you don't mind, what's the weirdest name you've come across in your research? Okay. So this is, this is a reference to a law review article I wrote in uh, 2011, and it's called Naming Baby, the Constitutional Dimensions of Parental Naming Rights. To what, and basically the question is, which I was just kind of curious by, you know, can you name your child anything you want? Or are there restrictions? And if so, what, if anything, does the U.S. Constitution have to say about this? Now, it, when I suggested this, that I would write this article to a senior colleague, he told me, oh, that's a stupid thing to write about. Why would you be interested in something like that? And I know it's just interesting. It's kind of a, a fascinating subject. And so I wrote about it. And until Donald Trump, I actually probably got more attention for baby names than I did for anything related to treason. And so there's a whole bunch of, I'm trying to, um, actually I can pull the, pull the article down. I found some a list of some of these truly, truly terrible names. So you think, well, who would, who, would, who would name a child? Well, here's one. Toilet oh, queen. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. Girl <laughs> nipple. <laughs> Leper. Cholera. Lo lo loser. <laughs> Sloth. Tiny hooker. Acne fountain. Legend belch. <laughs> 
Um, you know, and, and so th these are from U.S. census records. And I don't know that makes me be proud of my country that the people have done this. And other countries actually will not allow you to do that. They have, they say, you know, here's a list. Here's 300 approved male names. Here's 300 approved male names. You got to pick a name from there because we don't want you picking, you know, a name like, like Toilet Queen. <laughs> And so one of the things I try to figure out is, you know, you know, what, what are the limits, given that there are, I think, real harms to children from really terrible names. But at the same time, there's also First Amendment interests and other liberty interests in parents in terms of picking their names. You know, how should the government draw that line? And I think it's, it's a hard question. And I don't, you know, pretend that I have it necessarily that, you know, one obvious answer to it, because I think it's a challenging thing for governments to deal with. So the tension, basically, if we, if we just go back a bit to the scholarship, is the dichotomy between the freedom of speech point vis-a-vis -vis the harm to the child. Yeah, and so one of the things I argue is that there is a certain, there's an expressive value to the name. And so that the parent in selecting the name is, is making a statement. And so if you want to name your child, I mean, an old example from American history, name your child after George Washington, right? You're, you're sort of making a statement that you think that's good. And so I think a law that, say, barred a person from naming a child George Washington would be constitutionally problematic. Well, then suppose someone named a child Adolf Hitler, which happened in New Jersey. And the case came to light because the father went to the bakery and said, I want you to write a cake, right? Write happy birthday to my child on the cake. And what's the kid's name? It's Adolf Hitler. So write happy birthday, Adolf Hitler. And the bakery refused to do it. And ultimately, the people at that kind of brought them to the attention of social services, and they found other problems. And I think the kids were eventually removed from their household. But one of the problems under American First Amendment law is that we're not supposed to distinguish on the basis of viewpoint in terms of who we allow. And so we allow people to wear Adolf Hitler shirts. We allow people to wear George Washington shirts. And so is naming the child different than wearing the shirt? And I think you might say that it is in the sense that it has this sort of long-term permanent harmful consequence to another human being who has absolutely no ability to counter it really you know, with counter speech in the way that we expect people to do with those t-shirts, uh, say, in the public square. Well, Professor, I'm happy to report that neither of my children are called uh, amoebic dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> but can I just thank you on behalf of the team? That's been a magisterial hour and a quarter. You've covered more ground for us than, uh, than we thought possible. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, very happy to be here. Enjoyed yep. it a lot. And thank you for all the contribution to our podcast. Thank you for listening to Advocates, the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed the program. Please follow us on all our social media channels. Leave a review or share this episode. And don't forget to tag us. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Listen to the voices of the advocates.